Well, before we get into the message today, I'm going to take some time to brag on God. So I've been teaching church sound through a blog and YouTube channel for over a decade now, and this all began from a leading of the Holy Spirit, although honestly, I didn't recognize it was a lead of the Holy Spirit back when it happened more than 10 years ago, but it was. Um, But now with over 40,000 subscribers from all over the world, I mean, I'm just blown away by by what God has done through my obedience. This, it's not me, (laughs) y'all. You should have seen the, the... the silly 20-year-old that started this thing. This is clearly not me. But because of the influence that God has given me, I was invited to speak at a conference this past week in Denver. And uh, this was my first time teaching sound to a live audience. And it was a blast. There was about 200 churches represented at the conference. And it was just an honor to help them improve a very important aspect of their services. One of my favorite parts was being on the Q&A panel. Uh, to this audience, I'm known as the practical how-to guy when it comes to sound. They, most of them didn't even know I was a pastor. Uh, uh, you know, so the questions that were coming up, though, they weren't practical questions. They were more along the lines of spiritual growth. And as I submitted to the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of God just started pouring out of my mouth and uh, answering questions like, how do I balance volunteering at my church and working a job and having a family? I mean, those were the kinds of questions that were being asked. And the room was stunned with the wisdom that came out of my mouth because they didn't expect it from a guy that they thought only knew practical sound things, right? And at one point, the conference host said, Cade is also a pastor, for those of you who don't know, just because everybody was like, who is this guy? What is he doing? And I'm not boasting in myself, I'm boasting in God. He wants his people to have answers and he will pour his wisdom through anybody who is submitted to the Holy Spirit. I'm serious. He'll pour it through you too. All you got to do is submit. The Holy Spirit wants his people to have answers. I think some of us have this idea that he's holding back answers. He's not. He wants his people to have answers. The problem is we have a void of people who will submit to the Holy Spirit and let the, the wisdom of God pour out of their mouth. Submit to the Holy Spirit. So that was the first thing I want to brag on God about. It's just an honor to be a part of that conference. Here's the second thing. Our sheep... So I told a story at our 1 p.m. service last week, and now I'm going to tell you guys for context. Uh, it was about 10 days ago. Um, it was time to put our ram with his ladies. It's, it's breeding season at the young house for the sheep, not for Kate and Beth. And so we went to sheep class several months ago, and we practiced what's called tipping a sheep, which that's what you do if you need to do anything to the sheep. You get them on their rear end, and you lean their back against your legs, and when they're in that position, they just, they just sit there and let you check their teeth and, and do whatever needs to be done. Uh, the, pro- the difference is we were tipping lambs at our training, not full-grown rams. So we're talking about like a 70-pound sheep versus a 250-pound sheep. So, we got, so our, our ram, his name is Wasso. Not Owasso, but Wasso. That's an appropriate name, right? We named him Wasso. So we got Wasso in this little pen about the size of the front of this stage, and I got in there with him, and I'm just, you know, rams are known for ramming. That's, that's how they get their name. And so I'm a little bit nervous, because uh, he outweighs me by quite a bit. And so I'm just making sure we're friends, right? We're walking around the pen. I'm like, oh, Wasso, you know, you have a great home here, and I'm your daddy, and we're going to be nice to each other today. And I don't know how long this went on, but probably at least 20 minutes. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to have to do this. I'm just going to have to do this. <sighs> and so I get him in position, and I'm standing up next to him, and I grab his head, and I'm going to tip him. And so I get him over to his side, and then he kicks back with his back legs, and we both got tipped. <laughs> so we're both on the ground. And that's when Beth springs into action. At this point, she's on the outside of the pen that we had set up because she, I don't don't think she trusted me. I mean, she was on the outside of the pen. But she's like, oh, babe. And she jumps in, jumps over the fence, and she's trying to get in there as quick as she can. But luckily, I mean, he was already in that position, so he was chill at that point. So I just, we both got up together, and I I had him by the time she got in there. and, And we did what needed to be done. And what needed to be done was we needed to strap a little crown to his chest because that's how we know that the, uh, that the ladies have got hugged by Wasso, as we would tell our girls. That's, that's how sheep have babies. They, they hug each other. <laughs> and so we did that 10 days ago. And so I just wanted to testify. I don't know if you can see these two sheep right here that have a little blue on their rear end. They're, they're ready to fruitful. They were fruitful and they're going to multiply. I mean, in just, in just a few days, the young farm is multiplying. And I know this is weird for people who aren't farmers, right? But we just get excited when things like this happen. Like, we're going to have baby sheep now. And we're speaking over these sheep. We're going to say, you all are having twins, every single one of you. 
And, that, and since we took this picture, he's actually marked a third one. So just in like less than two weeks, we already have three sheep that have been bred. Now we're just waiting on that last one. It's exciting times at the Young House. All right, one more, one more thing. Look at this. We got a horse. And here's the cool thing about it. Somebody gave us this horse. And to add another layer of amazing, this person that gave us the horse doesn't even know us. We never, we never even met. They know somebody who knows us. I mean, only God could do this. And I'll tell some details behind this. So Beth loves horses. She had a horse as a kid, and she's just been waiting to get a horse. And uh, so she's looking at horses one day, oh, more than one day, right, for weeks. And she's like, Kate, I found this horse, and I found this horse, and I found this horse, and this horse. And I was like, babe... I don't think we're quite ready for a horse. Like, that's not in the budget right now. And we have a lot of other animals we're trying to learn how to take care of. And, and I mean, but she really wanted a horse. And she just said, uh, okay. And she submitted to my direction with a good attitude. And it wasn't a few days later that we get this call. Hey, so somebody I know has a horse. They're wanting to give it to you guys. Would, would you guys like a horse? So it's amazing how the Lord blesses obedience. Isn't that amazing? What a cool testimony. So I told you about the three blessings of God and then had Darla come up because I realized something. I refrain from talking about how God blesses me because of all the people who sour up when you start talking about blessing. And I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to tell you about the blessings of God. I must proclaim the goodness of God for all to hear, and you must do the same. Every time the Lord blesses you, tell everybody you can about it. And all the sour people that sour up at you and pucker up and say, well, God didn't bless me. And you're like, well, that's why. <laughs> I tell you what, you learn to be thankful for my blessing and you'll get blessed too. Amen. I'm a blessed man because I'm blessed by God. Amen. He has adopted me into the family and the blessing of Abraham chases after me. Yes. And it chases after you. Yes. Let that settle in. You know, God never asked us to think and act small. Quite the contrary. What did he say to us at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis? Be fruitful and multiply. He didn't say think and act small so that I look great. He said be fruitful and multiply because God's not worried about you prospering. You're not going to outshine God. <laughs> but you should be a demonstration of who he is. And that's why I am no longer going to call my business a small business. That's a bad confession. I'm going to call it a growing business. And I sent that to Darla. I sent that to Chris too. That's such, we should never call this a small church. We should call it a growing church. Amen. Amen. All right, let's get into today's message. The Holy Spirit has led me to read you the book of Ephesians. And when he led me to do this, I asked, why do you keep taking me back to the book of Ephesians? Why do you keep taking me back there? And here's what I heard the Holy Spirit say within my spirit. He said, because you are an Ephesians church. And my first thought was, wow, that's awesome. And then a few seconds went by and it occurred to me, oh crap. What warning did Jesus give to the church in Ephesus in Revelation? And so that's where I went first. I'm going to read you that before we get into Ephesians. So Revelation chapter 2. It's like, if we're Ephesians church, we better pay attention to what he said to the church of Ephesus in the last days. So Jesus said this, write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know the things you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. You've discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But, oh man, I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. So what do we have to watch out for? That word love there is the agape love. That we don't agape each other as we did at first. And so if you want to know if you're agape, agape-ing well, you have to read 1 Corinthians 13 and go through that list of things. And be like, how well am I agape-ing? 
the Lord and each other. And I think we're making progress on this. I think the Lord's already been, already been working this out in us. But if we have something to look out for, that's what we watch out for. Make sure that my love stays as fresh as it was whenever I first came to Christ. My passion and my excitement for not just Christ, but for the body of Christ, that I'm patient with each other. You know, so what I did whenever I read Ephesians preparing for this, I went and I highlighted every time the word agape was used in the book of Ephesians. And the apostle Paul was teaching the church in Ephesus this very important aspect in almost every chapter of the book of Ephesians because he had an insight, he had foresight of what they were going to be dealing with later on. So I'm going to read you the book of Ephesians, and I'm actually going to play some background music while I read this. And you're going to be surprised at how just this little bit of background music helps the book of Ephesians soak in. And I don't know why this is the case. This is something that the Lord is teaching me right now. Just the the purpose in sound that he has given, the purpose in music. Something about it, if you play the right music at the right time, helps you to connect more with your spirit. And I'm not doing this to give you some kind of emotional high. I'm doing this to give you a deeper connection with the scriptures. So go ahead and cue that up, Ethan. You're going to get something out of the book of Ephesians that you've never got before as many times as you've probably read it. Are you all ready for this? Listen in to the word of God. Lord, we thank you for your word, first of all. It is life to us. It is precious to us. So this letter is from Paul chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. And I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. It's what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And here's the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance and makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love, agape, for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly and I ask God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. And now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. You know, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. 
But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all that he has done for us who are united in Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done. So none of us can boast about it for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Hmm. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people, when in his own body on the cross, he broke down that wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of the law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. And now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. When I think of all of this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me, As you read what I've written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body, and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's holy people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I'm suffering for you, so you should feel honored. And when I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully, because then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now, all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. (laughs) Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever.
That's our uh, like founding scripture right there. I don't know if you knew that. We used to say it every Sunday, Ephesians 3.20. So when the Holy Spirit told me this last week that you're at Ephesians Church, I was like, well, yeah, that, <laughs> that makes sense. Ephesians 3.20, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more, no limits, than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. So therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. I want you to notice the instruction that he gives after this. Always be humble and gentle. Isn't it interesting that he starts out that way? Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. (laughs) Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love, agape. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. Paul was prophesying right there. Y'all are going to have a struggle with the love that you started with. So here's you some practical things to help you stay there. And I'm going to read it again. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. And make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. And that's why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. And notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens, so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. And now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. And this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. And then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown around by every wind of new teaching. We won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, agape. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love, agape. With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they've closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are, we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to all those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. So get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Imitate God, therefore, in everything that you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, agape, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these aren't for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. 
you can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful to even talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is head of his wife, as Christ is head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church, he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds it and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. And children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good that we do, whether we are slaves or free. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. So stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. And in addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop those fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so that I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for the Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep speaking boldly for him as I should. And to bring you up to date, Tychius will give you a full report what I am doing and how I'm getting along. He's a beloved brother and faithful helper in the Lord's work. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are doing and to encourage you. So peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters. And may God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you love, agape, with faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your word. 
Your word is truth and your word is life. And Lord, I thank you that this word today went into fertile ground and it will produce a harvest of 30, 60, and 100 fold. That none of this word will be rejected, none of it will be stolen out of our hearts, but it will go down deep and produce a harvest. So we submit ourselves to your word, Lord. We love your word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Isn't it amazing what the Lord can accomplish by simply reading the word? 